welcome to the Cloud Institute. My name is Jeff Fudge. I'm a new coach and presenter for the Cloud Institute. Welcome today. Today, I'm going to be talking about generative AI, also known as Gen AI. It's really to spread the message that Gen AI is more than just chat GPT. There are very many business cases that companies are using today and have been using for, for at least the last year. So we're going to introduce Gen AI and how AI has evolved over the years. We're going to talk about Gen AI business use cases. How are small, mid-market, and large companies using Gen AI today? We're going to talk about the different industries and how they're leveraging Gen AI capabilities. And then lastly, we're going to talk about what the future may hold with Gen AI and also have some bold predictions that people are making that might surprise you. So as I say, let's get this party started. And I apologize for the pixelation of this cartoon, but I chose this not only because I find it humorous, but I do believe that when people use a tool like ChatGPT, they wonder, okay, well, if it's something that can help me with my recipes, how is this going to impact the world at large? How is this going to impact large companies? And that's really what this webinar is all about. How do you take something that has a very simple chat interface on ChatGPT and use that to, for business advantage in a wide variety of ways? So let's talk about how AI has evolved to, into generative AI. If you look at AI and how it started, and I've been around long enough that I was born before there were computers. And so if you think about when AI first came about, yes, there were movies about artificial intelligence, but I think a lot of people thought of AI as something that was in an MIT lab. You've got a lot of very nerdy people in white coats, and you didn't think of AI as something that was very approachable, easily consumable by the common person. Um, it was something more that was just on the very edge, maybe some edge use cases, may, maybe something very large companies could use, but at great expense. And then machine learning came about, and that was a great evolution because it actually started working on sets of data. And we're going to learn, I'm going to talk about how that data had to be labeled and curated, but machine learning is in use um, in a variety of ways today. Most people don't understand if you have a Netflix subscription, they do understand that Netflix understands your viewing habits, but most people don't understand that when you see a movie advertised on Netflix, you assume that that same image of that movie is seen by everybody. But Netflix actually changes that movie graphic. If you like romance movies, it may select an image of that movie that portrays the romantic aspects. If you like action movies like I do, it might show a movie cover that is more action oriented. So they will flip the image of the movie and that's machine learning, learning about what you like and then deciding what kind of movie poster, essentially the little thumbnail to show you. And then the great leap forward, really, and why we're here today is to talk about generative AI. Gen AI will create new data. It generates new data. And that new data that it can generate is what separates it from other aspects of artificial intelligence that makes it really widely available for use and, and rather cost-effectively as well. I like this slide from Techopedia because it really goes into a little more detail on how AI has evolved, both from the purpose of that flavor of AI and also how it interacts with data. And so AI first evolved and it was really, okay, how can we use AI to really simulate the human brain, human intelligence? How can we teach it to do tasks that maybe we find mundane that are repetitive? Can it do things a little more reliably than maybe the average human employee can do? And so there was data interaction and different models were used, but they tried to find wide applications. But again, 
there was not widestream adoption. There were a lot of barriers to entry for companies to adopt AI. Machine learning, as we spoke about already a little bit, really makes predictions based on decisions. Um, well, it makes decisions and predictions based on data. Now, this data has to be curated and labeled. I was working on a project for a company. We had a large call center. We did a lot of work for companies like Uber and high volume businesses. And we had more calls than we knew what to do with. So the machine learning exercise was how do you take a large queue of people waiting to learn about a specific job opportunity? And how do you decide who is best fit for that job? Or if someone is applying for college um, funding, and wants to get some entry into, let's say, colleges that were paying my company to promote them. Can you take a look at that phone number? Can you take a look at the geographical information related to that phone number or where that person likely lives? And can you prioritize people in the queue so that they don't have to wait on hold? And if you're going to actually convert that person, if you're going to derive revenue from that person more likely than someone else, move them up in the phone queue. But that took a lot of time, a lot of data training. We had mixed results. And so, yes, a lot of good uses of machine learning out there to make predictions, to make decisions on incoming data. Uh, it can be used to identify fraud. I've worked for a number of retailers in e-commerce, and yes, we use machine learning to say, boy, this combination of um, purchases on the e-commerce website look a little bit out of the ordinary. But again, very, I would say, not necessarily niche use cases, but there are edge use cases that machine learning can be applied to. Generative AI takes a leap forward because it will assume that the data, whether it's clean or not, is data it needs to learn from. You don't have to hand feed it data. You don't have to curate the data, edit the data as much as you did with machine learning. And it's really that production of new data, whether it's producing a video, an image, a summary of documents, whether it's the way it interacts with um, the human voice and natural language processing, NLP or natural language understanding. It's really the way that it allows us to interact with it that sets it apart along with the amount of data that it can use to learn from. And I developed this slide to really show the difference between machine learning and Gen AI. As I mentioned with machine learning, that is hand labeled data. You have to often weight the data Consider this data point more than that point. Um, use a person's zip code to help understand the demographics about that person more so than just what the phone number represents. The name doesn't mean much, but the zip code might mean quite a bit in terms of what is the relative income or education level of someone. So you do have to hand label data. You have to curate it a little bit. And as I mentioned, the machine learning makes predictions or decisions. But here comes Gen AI, and Gen AI can work on messy real world data. And what is the greatest source of messy real world data? It's the internet. And so Gen AI now has a lot of knowledge. And admittedly, some of the data out there on the internet is crap, but a lot of it's good and valid information. And fortunately, the, the more common websites, the websites that are traffic, trafficked more frequently tend to be the more reliable sources. But the fact is, there's a whole vast amount of data that Gen AI can process that it can use to make decisions. Now, can you point Gen AI to specific data sets? Absolutely, you can. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more, but it's really the fact that it opens itself up to a lot more data sources, data sources that don't have to be, for the most part, curated, cleansed, instructed on how to use that data that sets it apart. Gen AI is still relatively new. Uh, you know, often when I want to understand when I do presentations, how common, let's say, a certain topic or keyword is, a certain technology, uh, Google Trends is a great way to do that. 
And OpenAI released ChatGPT, I believe it was November of 2022. And you can see how the searches have increased over time. The way that the Google Trends work, 100 represents the most searches that Google has ever seen for a keyword. So yes, it's dropping off a little bit over time. I didn't have time to do this up through um, last month. But it is still in everyone's, you see it in social media, you see it in the news, you see it referenced on TV, and on YouTube. So I, I firmly believe that unlike things like robotic process automation, RPA, that suffered from the hype curve that Gartner always talks about, and then you get into the band of disillusionment, you know, Robotic process automation or RPA was supposed to take over the world, and then it evolved into a very expensive solution for some um, high-end companies or companies with a lot of money to spend. I don't foresee that with ChatGPT. I think it's going to be around um, and as ubiquitous, as some people say, as the internet is today. So let's talk about some use cases. How are people, whether it's consumers or businesses, using Gen AI today? And here I listed some real world use cases. One is image generation, whether you're using Mid Journey, whether you're using Photoshop, Firefly, and Photoshop um, Generative Expand or Generative Fill that I use a lot. I run AWS user groups in Florida. I always have promotional images. I might find an image I like, but it really is landscape, but I need it to be vertical and portrait. I use generative fill to really refill that um, image out and expand. People do that in photos all the day. How do I take a mountain range with a picture of a couple and show more mountains in the background? And Gen AI is great for that. Most of the images that I'm using today were all part of Adobe Stock. Um, they often allow you, if you want just generative AI images to be shown, or if you, they, you want that along with hand composited images. So most of the images I'm using today were done with Gen AI. Text generation, you can have it do word summaries. You can point Gen AI to PDFs and say, I want you to summarize this information for me. You can point Gen AI to a website and say, please take all the information on the website. I want you to do a concise summary for me because I don't have enough time to do research. Drug discovery, as someone who's had a family member in the hospital recently, you always wonder, boy, just how good is the doctor and the nurses that I'm talking to? How are they giving the best care to my family member? And it's interesting as you dig deep and do research on how it can, Gen AI can take a look at an image and infer what might be going on. How does that image compare with thousands or tens of thousands of other medical imagery in terms of diagnosing uh, potential issues with the human body? Drug discovery, we're gonna talk about a little bit more. Music composition, you can have Gen AI um, generate music for you. Uh, virtual avatars, I've seen plenty of YouTube videos where it's using an avatar, someone has text, they use text to speech, and then the avatar, not always very well yet, but, you know, an avatar is a lot easier than having a person. Um, why are why is Hollywood upset about Gen AI? They're afraid that virtual actors will often replace real actors and they don't want to lose their livelihood. So Gen AI will certainly impact a, lo a lot of careers and not just in Hollywood. I mentioned the medical images, content recommendation. Uh, we're talking about how Amazon on their storefront is using Gen AI to help you decide what products are best for you. Anomaly detection really came about with machine learning, but here also a great use case for Gen AI and chatbots. And we're talking about how companies are using chatbots to reduce labor. You know, as you work for a lot of companies and you start looking at general ledger and PL statements, profit and loss statements, you realize the cost of human labor is one of the biggest expenses that companies have and call centers. 
in you know in the retail companies I've worked for, you always staffed up your call centers. You hired part time people to answer all the calls coming in. Shoppers have questions: When are the stores open? Well, how do I do a return? Or they're unhappy with the product. They're unhappy about their store experience. Chatbots can automate a lot of that. It used to be integrated voice response, IVR systems, and you go through that awful uh, voice tree, press one for this, press two for that. And now that automation um, is being better suited to chatbots and having it. It's still frustrating at times, I admit, but chatbots can help alleviate some of those call center issues and help desk issues. This was an interesting slide from Gartner. I promise not all of my source materials are from Gartner, but it's often a great research um, company to look at. And what they pose to companies is, what kind of business value are you seeing from Gen AI? And as an ex-developer and someone who works with cloud technology, you know, code efficiency and code development, you think, boy, Gen AI is going to be great at helping developers write code. And yes, it is. Both Microsoft and AWS have some great tools we're talking about in a little bit, but that's not the, the real value. That's not going to move the needle, so to speak, for companies. They're looking for operational efficiency. Um, companies have been looking at operational efficiency ever since I got into business after graduating from college. They will always look for operational efficiency, and Gen AI is yet another tool in their toolkit to use to achieve greater operational efficiency. And as we're talking about across almost every department of a company, instead of specialized edge cases or use cases just for a couple of departments. Sales enablement was a surprise to me, and I'm going to talk on in a couple of slides, how Gen AI is going to make the sales process and marketing process a lot more automated and a lot more tailored to individuals. So, so if you don't like cold calling, if you don't like people reaching out to you on LinkedIn, if you don't like getting emails about from salespeople, just keep in mind that with Gen AI, these are going to be a lot more tailored to you. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then they list all the other aspects that they're driving value from. But, but it's really sales enablement and operational efficiency um, that they are driving value from Gen AI today. And I don't expect that to change um, in the coming years, at least not quickly. This was an interesting slide uh, from Gartner that really talks about the, the use case examples in different functions of a company. And you can see it has a wide range of application across a typical company. In customer service, I mentioned chatbots. It doesn't have to be customer service. It can be help desk. Um, but how do you have a virtual assistant, a digital human, a chatbot, accept natural language queries from someone, and sometimes even voice, and answer them back with an answer. If you think about the traditional help desk, especially in IT, someone says, my monitor is not working. I can't log into this application. And as someone who's managed help desks before, that person is looking in a knowledge base and trying to then say, well, have you done step one? Have you done step two? That's easy to automate. That's easy for a Gen AI chatbot to read all that information, all that knowledge base, and be just as smart, if not come across smarter to help diagnose a problem than, let's say, um, a minimum wage help desk person who really isn't yet real familiar with technology, but can read a knowledge base. Finance, I'm going to talk about a finance sector, so I won't go into any great deal here. Um, HR, I'll talk about briefly a use case my current company is working on. It's a company that is owned by private equity, and the private equity company has a need to op to increase the efficiency of their companies. The more these, these companies operate efficiently, the more their margin increases, the more profitable they are. And private equity companies own companies to pretty them up and then to sell them. So efficiency is big on private equity owned companies, uh, maybe even more so than the typical company because they are in it for profit and they don't want to own the company very long. So they want to improve it today. 
So we have a use case where this HR department says we have so many, we have tens of thousands of employees and we staff up our HR department and people ask, what is, a, what is our vacation policy? What is the bereavement policy? How many hours of vacation do I get? How do I file a complaint? And so the use case is take Gen AI, in this case, AWS, Amazon Q for business, point it to all of our PDFs, our Word documents of all of our HR policies. And can you translate that using Gen AI to multiple languages? Can you allow non-English speaking employees to ask questions? And so this is a use case that's applicable not only to HR and HR policies and procedures, to anything that is document-based. If you have a history of documents that you want Gen AI to learn from, um, you know, Gen AI can assist you there. IT, Microsoft Copilot, Amazon Q for developers, great at helping IT individuals be better at their jobs, write better code. And borrowing code is nothing new. Um, you you search Google, you search your code repo, you find, oh, there's some great code I can reuse. Let me copy and paste that. This is just copy and paste on steroids with some intelligence from Gen AI to know good code from bad code. And it can actually take a look at your code and reformat uh, your code, refactor your code to be a little bit better because it has studied code and has learned what is efficient coding practices and what is not efficient. Legal, I'm not going to read through all the slide, marketing operations. The point here is there is a use case for just about any department in a company to leverage Gen AI. It always comes down to what is the effort required to implement and what is my return on investment. So what I see as a company that has a Gen AI practice is not our primary focus, but I see companies still looking at all the different use cases saying, how do I find one that will be relatively easy to implement to get us comfortable with Gen AI? And then we'll talk about how to leverage that throughout the company. But Fortune 500, it's a lot easier for them to find ROI. The SMBs, the mid-market companies, just a little bit different. So let's look at some industry use cases in finance. Bloomberg has Bloomberg GPT, a large language model, which is really their neural network that has um, educated itself, so to speak, on all the data sources. Um, and it's been trained on 40 years of financial data. So if you use a Bloomberg um, interface, a specialist, it is learned from 40 years of financial data and probably arguably more efficiently than a human could. Morgan Stanley has an AI basis uh, assistant. It's leveraging GPT-4 and they are using 100,000 different research reports. So when you ask questions to the Morgan Stanley assistant, it's learned from all those research reports which you could argue might be more effective than almost all of the research analysts or financial experts that you might find at Morgan Stanley. Not always as accurate. Um, there's always the um, hallucinating um, of Gen AI where it might come back with the wrong answer. But um, I think we'll just see that the accuracy will continue to increase over time. If you use Wells Fargo, um, they have a predictive banking feature that uses Gen AI. This is to help you understand how to use your money most efficiently. Something a human probably did in the past, or if you are a Verizon customer like I am, you'd always talk to someone, well, looking at your financial records, we think you might be able to save some money by moving to a different model. Um, but this is going to be now pushed to you instead of waiting for you to call and get that advice. So the advantages in finance, less software development, instead of developers writing code to give you access to information that's been summarized, instead of using data lakes or data warehouses, Gen AI can consume vast amounts of data and summarize it and make it concise more efficiently for the consumer, the consumer of the information. Um, information is summarized quickly here for the financial advisors, and it results in better decision making and better recommendations for your financial future. 
software, obviously, as um, a typical consumer, for those of us on the tail end of a lot of these software applications, Gen AI has been really a great advancement for these companies, for them to add new features. Adobe launched Firefly, so if you use Photoshop, if you use Illustrator, um, it's Firefly is a technology that um, will create the generative fill and generative remove. You know, I, I'm on a, um, a Reddit, a subreddit where people say, hey, can you remove someone from this photo or can you get a better background for this photo? And before Gen AI came about, that, that um, subreddit was dominated by people that were very good at things such as Photoshop and inventing backgrounds after removing an object. And, and Photoshop had tools to do that. But now with generative fill, um, it takes about 10 seconds to remove an object from a photo. So it's interesting to see how um, that has really made the mainstream photo editing and things that would have been professionally done in, in the past, um, very easy to do now with a generative fill and generative remove. Google added AI overview. So if you use the Google search engine, you'll notice that at the top of the screen, they're still kind of experimenting with that, but you'll see a Gen AI um, summarization of findings. And I think you'll see that gets better and more advanced over time. I work for an AWS partner. So Q for Business takes Gen AI and it'll point to PDFs, Word documents, or it'll point to APIs instead of you using, say, Salesforce to look at your leads coming in for your business. You can use Q for Business to ask questions. The Gen AI engine for Q for Business will interact with Salesforce, take all that data, learn from that. So instead of learning the Salesforce UI and using that to actually answer questions that you have, you can use natural language to query backend systems. And I believe there's um, hundreds of API supported today and that'll just grow over time. So again, natural language interfaces to a lot of your business applications. And then Q for developers is just um, similar to Copilot from Microsoft to develop um, increased developer productivity. So the advantages Gen AI and software, faster access to information, increases the efficiency in software development, and greater creative control over media and content. So here are some commercial applications, some open source. Uh, Chat GPT, most people know about. Grammarly has always improved your, your language skills, your grammar, your spelling. It's now... Um, increased its value and its accuracy with Gen AI. Stable diffusion is great at image creation, just as is uh, Adobe's Firefly technology. Liner, if you've ever used Liner, like a lot of these tools, there's a free and then there's a paid version. Liner is great for doing research. I used it uh, a bit in researching this, this um, content for this presentation. I use Otter AI on every customer call that I'm on. It does a great job of summarizing. It not only generates a transcript, summarizes, it'll do next steps um, for me because I'm not always great at documenting, okay, what were the next steps, but it will infer what the next steps are based on the transcript and the language, Microsoft Copilot, Amazon Q, and the list goes on and on. We're gonna see Gen AI be utilized in just about every application Quite often it's marketed, sometimes it's not marketed as being AI infused, but uh, Gen AI is definitely here to stay. Talking about automotive uses, this was a little surprising to me. BMW has 600 or over 600 use cases for the use of Gen AI. And one of the simplest use cases is going onto the website and having the customer find the right car for their needs. Now this isn't new, um, but developers were written that if someone asked this, um, the developer would decide to now let's ask that. And so that was not an efficient process. Gen AI can speed that process up with chatbots. And so you're not paying developers to come up with their version or their boss's version or the business version of what a good process would be to get a customer to the right car for their needs, their family needs, their financial situation, 
Do they want it sporty? Do they want it more family oriented? Chatbots are making all that more efficient and cheaper to produce. Toyota, I listed here using Gen AI to make designing cars more efficient. I'm sure others are, but sometimes this isn't public information. If you look at all the factors that go into designing a car, how is the wind efficiency and the in the in the drag? Um, how is it going to handle? Let's make it ergonomic. Let's make it safe. Let's make it apply to all the Department of Transportation regulations for vehicles. So all of that goes into a car designer, and there's obviously tools to help them. But Gen AI is going to lower that curve, all those constraints, and make a faster decision. Is Gen AI going to design cars on its own? And no, there's always going to be some human and human involvement, at least for now. But it's definitely making that process more efficient. In-car navigation systems, personal voice control over your car, all different ways that the auto manufacturers are using Gen AI. As someone who has worked on multiple e-commerce sites for retailers, um, e-commerce, and I, I just noticed my slide wasn't changed, still says auto manufacturers, but e-commerce is still using Gen AI to great effect. In Amazon, instead of you having to look through all the different reviews, what do people like? And I do the same thing. What are the five-star reviews? What are the one or two-star reviews? What do people like and dislike? Amazon is using Gen AI to parse through hundreds or thousands of reviews and summarize here's what people like, here's what people don't like. Again, making the process more efficient for you as a consumer. Wayfair launched a, a, a feature they call Decor Decorify. To, so you can take a picture of your home, put a certain piece of furniture in there and decide, do I like that look of that couch or chair? Why do they like to do that? Because if you get that furniture delivered to your house, you don't like how it looks, you're going to return it. And companies lose a lot of money on returns. They have to pick it up usually for free. And that takes time and effort. And then they have to put that, that furniture back in stock. Um, I worked for Ashley Furniture and we, you know, one of the, the cost of e-commerce is taking photos of all the furniture. And so it's common to hire 3D modelers and engineers that can take a look of photos of a piece of furniture and render that in three dimensions. So that can be rotated and used in a photo. Gen AI can do that quite powerfully without high-end workstations and expensive talent. Shopify, if you sell on Shopify, I do not, but um, Shopify will help you as a store owner. Generate emails, be better at generating marketing content, sales product, product descriptions. Again, it's powering you to do things that you could do on your own, but it would take you a lot more time. Um, and this is providing that power and that creative ability to anyone who has a store. So those are all the common use cases. Let's talk about what some people predict as the future of Gen AI. Um, from Gartner in 2025, which is not that far away, that's next year, 30% of all outbound messages will be personalized. To me, personalization used to be, dear, insert your name here. And it's always funny when I get emails or something on that says, dear, and they get my name wrong. But this isn't just personalized inserting your name. This is understanding you, um, understanding your buying behavior. And if you're like me, you search for something on the internet and then on TikTok, those ads show up within 20 minutes. That's a little unnerving. I expect us to be a little more unnerved in 2025 as these messages start getting more and more personal. And if you don't restrict what your data can be used for, if you don't like personalized ads, now is the time to act because they will continue to get more personalized. Gen AI will be used more than 30% um, of the time and it's only 2% in 2022. And I expect that to continue to grow. I think this is a pretty... Pretty interesting prediction. In 2025, AI avatars will support 70% of digital marketing communications. So instead of paying an individual, instead of paying for someone to talk about the product, AI avatars will be 
a lot more realistic and be used more effectively. They're not quite used in many mainstream movies yet, but I think they will be. 30% of new drugs and materials will be automatically and systematically discovered. If you think about how drugs um, are discovered today, it's a lot of trial and error. Gen AI will speed that up. And so ideally, in the in you know, in best case possible, that lowers the price of drugs because of the cost of research and development is reduced. Will big pharma pass those savings on to us? You know, remains to be seen. By 2026, 20% of all repetitive process will be automated by domain-specific Gen AI. Domain-specific meaning not just someone using chat GPT-4, but have an industrial, have an automotive, financial-specific Gen AI large language models dedicated to that industry. The low-hanging fruit will be automated just like a lot of it was using RPA, robotic process automation. So Mustafa Suleiman, if you study Gen AI or AI, you probably know that he's currently, I believe, the CEO of AI at Microsoft, but he also co-founded DeepMind. He sees AI becoming more interactive in that it can do tasks for you. If you use Microsoft Copilot, you could say develop a PowerPoint deck on this subject matter, and it will go ahead and produce 10 or 12 slides uh, as a good starting point. You know, that's a little bit better than trying to find a template on Microsoft or paying for a template that's not really on the topic, but you like the theme, this is actually generating the content for you. And so you can envision a day where your productivity is increased because you have your your chat, your co-pilot, your interactive digital human helping you do a lot of the chores that you could do but using your time more efficiently on strategic initiatives. There's also a lot of debate. Is all of this Gen AI change, the way it's being adopted across small businesses all the way up to large businesses, is this is going to be great for the workforce? And to a certain extent, yes, there's going to be, in my humble opinion, it's going to be make us all more productive at what we do if you understand how to use the tools. It's going to help you sometimes because your employer is going to put that tool in front of you. Sometimes it's going to help you because you're using it behind the scenes to make you productive during the day. And if you don't have the skills to use it or you don't have access to the tools, then I think then it, it will put you at a disadvantage. Will it disrupt and will it automate some jobs? Will people lose their jobs? I think the answer is yes. But techno technology has always put people out of jobs, you know, to use a, a tried and true comparison when um, the Ford, um, when the automotive um, car was invented, that put people out of work. When the internet came about, that put people out of work. When um, Netflix um, started shipping um, CDs, that put stores. So. I don't think technology has never not displaced jobs. It could be Gen AI will displace more jobs than other advancements in technology, but I think that's just the cost of evolution. Here are some bold predictions that I was able to pick up uh, over the internet. Gen AI-based robots will work at some point in the near future on construction sites, retail stores, hotels. And if you ever look at some of the Atlas um, robot videos on YouTube, the agility that they have, already moving parcels. When I worked for Ashley Furniture, we had a lot of robotics already in our manufacturing plants, doing a repetitive nailing, um, cutting boards, moving boards, assembling furniture. Did they look like humans? No, but they were robotics nonetheless. But this is one step above that saying, let's have a robot that can think on its own. It's not just trained. And if an exception occurs, it waits for someone to intervene and move the, maybe move the pallet of wood or furniture supplies so it knows what to do. This is actually doing um, work that is done today by humans. And I, I think we'll see that. I think it'll be limited rollout. It'll be a niche, maybe just a novelty, but I do think that's coming Enterprise workflows, conversational AI, instead of going to, let's say, 
um, a screen to learn information, you're just going to use natural language. That'll be more efficient than pointing and clicking. Chatbots we've spoken about, AI-powered copywriting to create blog posts, social media. I think that is not going to be great necessarily for people who are paid to do that. Um, a Gen AI generated song will break into the Billboard Top 100 or Spotify Top Hits. Is that going to ruin our our interest in music because we find that our favorite song was generated by Gen AI and not an artist that we can relate to, not someone that we can follow? And it's really more about the music than the artists themselves. And who gets paid if that company is being if that sorry that song is being streamed? Is the person who um, did the prompt engineering to create the music getting paid? It's going to be interesting as we see more and more media and songs and movies generated with Gen AI. In Hollywood production, I think I read where special effects are typically 25% of a movie budget, um, unless it's completely shot on location. Um, but uh, it doesn't have to be Star Wars to use special effects. A lot of companies use special effects just to have nice mountain ranges or very attractive backgrounds. It limits the amount of money they need to spend. If they can eliminate 25%, if it's a movie produced for $100 million, that's $25 million that they can save some of. If generative AI with generative fill and the ability to generate movie content, movie-worthy content for high-end movies. A lot of money to be saved, and who knows, maybe it reduces the cost of going to a movie theater. So the takeaways from this to me, I don't see Gen AI as a technology trend that's gonna go from hype cycle to a few new um, niche cases over the years. I've been in technology for over 40 years. I've seen a lot of trends come and go. Every trend has got that marketing hype. I think Gen AI will be like the internet. Gen AI will be like when computers were invented. It's something that's going to be part of our daily lives, whether you like it or not. All aspects of businesses are going to be able to use it across all different industries, all different types of jobs. Just about every commercial software product, phone, you saw Apple saying they're weaving Gen AI into their iOS, their operating systems. I'm sure Apple will do that with their Mac OS, and it's already being embedded into Windows. It's going to make us all much more uh, productive in our daily jobs. And chatbots, unfortunately to me, will become the primary way you interface with companies. You're going to have to get through a chatbot first. It's already that way with a lot of companies. Being able to speak to a human on day one is going to be um, difficult. A trick that I have learned and have been taught that if you're talking to um, voice prompts, if you are chatting with a chatbot, they have sentiment analysis. They know if you're happy or not. If you want to break out of that cycle, if you want to talk to a human, state that you're unhappy. State that you're thinking about closing your account. That sentiment analysis, that deciding if you're a happy customer or an unhappy customer, you're much more quickly moved out of that that seeing that endless loop of questions before you speak to a live person, just um, go ahead and state that you're unhappy. You may close your account and you can break out of that loop faster. But my closing, one of my closing comments here is ride the wave or be hit by the wave, your choice. But I encourage everyone to educate themselves on Gen AI. I love this quote. Gen AI is not just a technology or a business trend. It is a profound shift in how humans and machines interact. So we are learning how to interact with artificial intelligence with the natural language. And that sets this apart from any other type of AI. The fact that it is as easy as chatting with another person um, is really what's going to set Gen AI apart. So if you want to link to me on LinkedIn, here's my code, or you can just do a search on Jeff Fudge. Uh, be happy to talk to you about Gen AI, um, or if you have any interest in Gen AI for your business or use cases, you can reach out to me from a professional perspective. I've also included some references that will be part of this presentation deck that will be shared with everybody um, on Cloud Institute. 
And I want to thank you. Thank you for joining us at the Clown Institute. I do have some additional webinars coming up. I'll be talking about how the cloud is really revolutionizing um, data center operations. I've run data centers myself, um, both co-location and on-prem data centers. And I'll also be talking about AWS and my knowledge about after using AWS and cloud technology for 10 years, some insight there. But join us if you can, reach out to us on LinkedIn. You've got some email addresses, the website. Thanks again for joining and we hope to see you soon.